subject to exactly the same potential use by others, <coughs> including the title holder, that they would have had otherwise. It's not as though you can fence in minerals. I mean, I, I do accept that there is a hypothetical situation whereby you could dig around in a circle and they wouldn't have access from above or below for some particular reason, but save for the absolutely absurdly extreme situation, a mineral that has not been dug out, a, pl a piece of solid that has not been dug out in the void of is not possessed. And why would this not be the case? The point of limitation is to protect somebody who has been using land for years, now having to defend against a paper title. But if you haven't actually extracted the mineral in question, you haven't been using that land. <coughs> <coughs> now, every time you dig a bit further, you trespass a bit further, you convert a bit more. The other peculiarity is, of course, minerals and subsurface solids tend by their very nature not to be used for long periods of time. So an owner not excavating the property now in order to dispossess the trespass is going to be the norm. Now, you can see this coming through in a variety of cases. And I'll take your lordships to them in a while. But you've got Ricardo, you've got McDonald and McKinty, Davis and Shepherd. I will go through those shortly. The point is this. If you are the paper, type, paper title holder of surface and subsurface, then you are deemed to be in possession of the subsurface. But that's okay. But clearly that sort of deemed possession does not work for a severed title. And clearly that sort of deemed possession should not work for a trespasser. And we go further. We say you can't have actual possession of minerals, save for those which are actually worked. <clears throat> so you start with this problem. How do you possess the subsurface at all, other than by extraction and occupation of void? And this is, well, can I ask how far are you go with this submission? Um, is it your submission that adverse possession simply can't apply to a subsoil? Um, because I had understood it to be common ground that in theory and in appropriate circumstances it could do, although you of course argue it doesn't apply in the circumstances of this case. It has to be exceptionally extreme circumstances. And here's one particular reason why unless you have very extreme circumstances of how you have taken in, under control minerals or s solids. Unless you've taken control of them to the point where you are physically excluding somebody else from digging into them. How do you get an action or possession of the ground? Now time runs for claims to possession of land. Adverse possession runs from the date the paper title holder can bring a claim or possession. 
if service type, surface type holder digs a 10 cubic square meter pit and they occupy that 10, surface, 10 cubic meters by throwing trash into it, whatever, landfill, <coughs> you can bring an action for possession of the void that remains. You can also bring an action for conversion of whatever was extracted, but you can bring an action for possession of the void. You could probably get injunctions as well to fill it in and so on and so forth. But that possession of the void is an action that can be brought. But how would you bring an action for possession of the unextracted part of the subsurface? If you sought an order to eject the surface type, the trespassing then the answer would be, we're not there. We did not occupy, so you cannot eject. And, since we didn't extract, you're not entitled to damages either. <coughs> it might be, in, you know, it could be, in certain situations, that if you had taken sufficient control of the minerals in such a way that you were preventing somebody else from getting in those circumstances, yes, you could probably get an action for possession, excluding them from this area, inclusive of the area that's being controlled. But it's going to be an exceptionally difficult factual situation to end up in. Because whilst you can occupy a room, suppose no one else was in this, this courtroom, I could occupy this entire room by standing here. And there's a meaningful sense of saying that I'm occupying the room that I'm standing in. I can't occupy the space taken up by this desk. I can't occupy the land, the, the ground under my feet in a way that I can be ejected. And if I can't be ejected from it, then I can't have an action for possession brought against me. And if I can't have an action for possession brought against me, Now, just starting going through the authorities on that, we start with, uh, and it's a, a brief reference, I grant you, in the case of Bocardo, which is well, a tab 50, authorities bundle 3. And it's paragraph 31 at page 399 of the report. And I'm not, I'm not pretending that this is a particularly useful or extensive reference. It's just a starting point. Uh, so Bocardo was um, basically digging under Star Energy. Uh, sorry, Star Energy was digging under Bocardo. Um, and uh, paragraph 31, <clears throat> as Aikens LJ said in the Court of Appeal, it is difficult to say that Bocardo had actual possession of the strata below the Oxton estate, as it's done nothing to reduce those strata into its actual possession. Then goes on to explain, but it held that Ricardo was the paper type of strata, and all within it, except for some special bits that are excluded, has the prima facie right to possession of those strata, so it's deemed to be in factual possession. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that goes very far, but it's a starting point and explains really what our position is. What to reduce those strata into its actual position uh, possession means is more difficult to discern. If I can then turn back to, <coughs> it's going to be authorities bundle two. And I'm going to start at tab 40. So this is an Irish, uh, no, sorry, not Irish, this is uh, Queen's Bench. Is that right? Donald McKinty, yes. Queen's Bench. Case. Uh, I think it is actually Irish. It's in the county of Antrim. I'm relatively certain it's persuasive rather than on an English court binding. 
So this was a case where the Earl of Antrim granted lands to a McCutcheon in 1738, and he reserved mines, minerals, and quarries. And the claimant in this case, uh, MacDonald, was the successor in title to the Earl of Antrim, and McCutcheon uh, never opened the quarries, but his successors in title did in some but not all cases. <clears throat> and it was held there was no dispossession of unopened quarries, and that's at 525 to 526. And if I turn to 525 to 526, 525. In 525, right at the bottom, third line from the bottom. It's quite obvious that no actual dispossession of the unworked mines by any act of dominion over them by McCutcheon or its representatives was alleged or proved. The original possession, <coughs> whatever that was, remained unaltered. No act was done or claims made at variance or inconsistent with the right of the Antrim family, which right was whenever they pleased, without limitation or time, to enter, search for, and work. <coughs> so what they're saying there is the fact that you open a mine over there doesn't give you possession of a mine over here, no actual possession. And that's, one would think, a degree of common sense. There is a small amount also to be gained from the very last paragraph of this judgment. At the bottom of 526, uh, uh, it remains to notice an observation made by me during the argument. Using possession of a part of the quarries might possibly be deemed to constitute possession of the whole. This, if it involves an inference of matter of fact, that is, if the possession of part was evidence of possession of whole, should have left, been left the jury, and had the judge refused it, it might have been a matter of specific exception, but this was not done. On the contrary, the exception asserts that there was no question to be left to the jury, but that they should have directed to find a verdict for the defendant. It may, however, be suggested that from possession of part, the possession of whole is a matter of legal presumption. If it, and this is the problem. We've got no doctrine of legal presumption. Possession of a part is if it were, then the defendant would have been right in calling for a direction in his favour. There is, however, no authority for saying that it is. Such a presumption of law is never made but in favour of the right. So, for example, if you are the title holder to it, you're presumed to be in possession. Here, it would be subversive to the express agreement of the parties to the deed of 1738, for though as had been observed, the exception of the mines would itself give right to work them. The deed shows an intention to recognise and effectuate that right, using the largest terms by which this exercise can be granted, guaranteed, and secured. But besides this, we have the authority of Lord Eldon and Sir W. Grant in the case of Adair against Shafto and Seaman against Audrey. The mines, from their nature, are exempted from this presumption, which non-user justifies in other kinds of property. For mine, and all that presumption of non-user doesn't really apply to us, but for mines are frequently purchased or accepted with a view to their being opened and worked at a future time, and very seldom with any intention of immediate use. The exceptions must be treated to be overruled. Now, what I'm getting from that it's twofold. First of all, you don't have actual possession of a solid or a sort of subsurface or a mineral that you are not actually working on or possessing. You do not have a legal presumption of such, or there is no principle of legal presumption of such by, way, by means of which possession of part is possession of the whole. This is a different concept the one that I will be returning to, of evidence of possession of one part is evidence of possession of the whole. It's evident, evidential as to whether or not you are uh, claiming possession. And you do get effectively a, a what's called a legal presumption in one sense or deemed in another where the title holder of the surface, where it's a whole material, surface and subsurface, is deemed to be in possession of the subsurface. And the next case I want to take your lordships to is tab 42, Davis and Shepherd. And in particular, Power of, uh, page 415. And this is Lord, Lord Chancellor Lord Cranworth 
saying in the first full paragraph, when the owner of real property, whether surface land or mineral, finds himself by a written agreement to want a lease and suffers his intended lessee without a lease to take possession, he must be understood to allow the lessee to take possession of all which he is engaged to mine. So, and this ultimately, effectively, again, title holder occupying deemed of everything. In the case of a demise of unworked minerals, there can hardly be said to be actual possession of any part of them except of what the intended lessee is actually working. So if you haven't got actual possession of something, how can you be, or how can you have an action of possession made against you? It carries on. But I think that when the lessee, lessor allows his intended lessee to take possession, and the lessee does take possession and commences working accordingly, he must be considered as constructively in possession of all which the lessor has bound himself to mind. Again, the title allows them to be deemed to be in possession. <coughs> Now, it's not impossible for the manner of doing something to get there. I, I do accept that. And that comes out as a possibility in the case of Ashton Stock, which is at tab 43. And Vice Chancellor Hall, by this stage, at page 726, <coughs> 726, first full paragraph, about 12 or 13 months later. That being so, the next consideration is whether there is any difficulty in the plaintiff's way by reason of the defendant having been working and getting some of this coal for a period of more than 20 years. I can well understand that there might be cases in which, from the manner of working coal, a person who began to work it was a mere wrongdoer and trespasser might have acquired a title to a certain seam or area of coal, and that, by the manner of mode of driving the levels and opening a certain area of the coal, there might have been possession acquired to the whole thing as a mine or as a seam of coal, and not merely to the particular quantity of coal that was actually hewn and gotten. They're saying you might do it, depending on how you specifically dig out, mine, open up. That is not, however, this case, and it's not necessary for me to say more than such a case may exist. All that we have in this case is that the adjoining proprietor, while engaged in working his own coal, has gone on working into the vein and getting out a certain quantity of his neighbor's coal. So this is somebody who's actually mining coal, not just digging out a bit of a road, but actually mining coal and they dig into their neighbour's coal and carry on specifically mining it, and they still don't get possession of the scene. That unquestionably will not give a title under statute or in any way to the wrongdoer. If you can't get possession by means of deliberately mining a seam of coal, it seems very, seems likely, seems almost inevitable it's going to be very difficult on the facts to say ever that you are in possession of anything other than that which you have worked. Uh, I, I mean, I understand the point you're making, Mr. Moran, but the, the bit you showed us first about might be possession of the mine or the sea, are you, how, how, does that, how does that fit with what you've just said? Well, what you've just said seems to me to mean that that's wrong. No, it's, the, it's <laughs> difficult to see how that happens. I'm not saying that it's physically impossible. There are going to be exceptional circumstances in which your the manner in which you do it leaves you with the whole of the remaining part of the scene. You dig around in a circle and you're left with a bit in the middle, perhaps. But if you're just digging in, if that's not going to do it, it's going to have to be something really quite exceptional to possess the remainder of the scene. I mean, these people were deliberately mining coal and they didn't get it. And I'm not I'm saying that it's it, you know. The, the, the judgment of the vice chancellor is, is that this is possible, theoretically, maybe, but not identifying how you could in fact do it. And I, I equally am saying <coughs> it is possible, theoretically, maybe, to take possession of more than just the bit you've dug out in certain circumstances. But it's going to require something quite specific. And we haven't got anything close to that in this particular case. 
Well, if you once allow the possibility, why is it not then just a question for evidence in the usual way as to whether that condition is satisfied, bearing in mind all the points you make about the physical impossibility, so to speak, of taking possession of a, a solid? <laughs> There's going to be two questions. You have to ask two different questions. <clears throat> the first, well, there are two, di not that you have to ask two different questions, there are two different questions. The first is whether evidence of possession of one place is evidence of possession of another. And that's if I graze my cow here, am I claiming possession there? If I graze my cow on black acre, am I claiming, is it actually claiming? If I maintain the, there's a couple of cases, a specific case, if I maintain this particular part of the hedge, does it indicate that I'm actually claiming possession for the whole of the continuous hedge? Yes. There is a different question of whether my actions are capable of being possession in another area. Is the other area capable of being physically possessed? Is now, it, but isn't the point that you made in the case you just showed us that the answer to that, that question at the level you pitch it is yes? Possibly, yes. <laughs> but, but, and here's the problem, you're going to need something more than simply digging out because you have the difficulty, which is that you can't actually physically possess something. So you're going to need to do something more that takes possession of it. Now I would say the, what the answer that I could think up was this. Supposing you have a bed that can only be accessed horizontally, for whatever reason. There's di diamond solid above and below, dangerous materials above and below. And you dig in a circle, and you're left with the centre of the circle. You have, I think in those circumstances, <laughs> taken possession of that bit that you haven't actually dug out because you've controlled it and you've got the void around it. And nobody can get to it from above or below. It's an extreme circumstance. It's going to be very unlikely. But you have got possession of that through controlling its circumstances. But there are going to be very few situations where you are possessing a solid that you have not dug out. You have not done anything to take it into your possession. And I come back to this. How can I eject you from a piece of material that you have not dug into? I can eject you from the whole of the field where you've walked into it. I can eject you from a house where you haven't necessarily walked into the attic yet. And I can include within that ejection the attic. But if there is physically a lump of soil that you can't even get into as it currently stands, how do I eject you from that? You're not there. And if I can't eject you, if I can't bring an action for possession, time doesn't run. But if you have, if the defendant has evinced an intention to exercise dominion over whatever the substance is, I mean, obviously, um, mudstone in the present case, in whatever circumstances it suits his commercial or other purposes to do so in a specified area, why can one not extrapolate from actions which are taken as and when it is convenient for the person in question to do it and treat that as an intention to occupy the whole which can, given appropriate facts, constitute adverse possession? Well, because adverse possession requires that time runs from the date that I can get the and if you're not actually physically possessing... Well, you could get it on a queer timid basis, couldn't you, if there was a clear and manifested intention to exercise dominion over the... You, well, queer timid wouldn't give you possession. It would give you an injunction preventing them going into possession. All right, it would give you an injunction. And, and that actually highlights what I'm saying. They haven't gone into possession yet. <laughs> if it's queer timid, they haven't done it yet. I mean, you're, I mean, I understand you say you can't possess the inside of the bench that doesn't 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 one have to maintain to give me an element of realism about this? If you take the black acre, white acre law, and let's say that there's a there's a piece of land, uh, and, and the person does all the things.
things necessary that we would normally regard as adverse possession. They take it, they take it over, they walk all over it, they put their cows on it, they fence it, they do all those things. Um, but in the middle of the field, there's a tree. And it's a big oak tree, and it's a metre diameter. The cows never go inside the oak tree. The person never goes inside the oak tree. You can't eject anybody from the inside of the oak tree. So why isn't the, the extreme point that you're making, which I understand, I mean, it's true that you can't go inside the bench, you can't go inside the oak tree, mean that in fact, contrary to what everyone might have thought for the last thousand years or so, uh, you don't get possession of the whole field, you get possession of all the grass, but not the bit that's inside the tree. The first point is that, in, in reality, they're all occupying that lump of tree, and it's never, it's never going to be a question of practicality, because no one is ever going to require them to excuse themselves from the tree unless they're nailing themselves to the tree and putting their the, which is why, as a matter of practicality, no one's ever going to raise that as an issue. Because they're not occupying it, and therefore you don't need it. And, and if you describe it... I'll tell you what, if I, was the, if I was the paper title holder to a piece of land that someone wants to build a whole lot of houses on, and they're getting adverse possession of it, I think the fact that I own the inside of the oak tree in the middle of the field would be a pretty valuable economic right. Yeah. The second thing is that if that's uh, a vertical thing, they can theoretically possess above, above that. And the third thing is, it is with a tree, which is growing out of the field in which you're talking, that's part of the surface title. So by the time you're possessing that surface title as a whole, you can include the parts within it. So for example, <coughs> if you're possessing a building, adversely possessing a building, possessing, including the walls and so on, because it's part of what you are physically It's different for a solid under the ground. You've dug out a void and you're possessing that void. You're not possessing anything thereafter. You're not actually possessing it and it's difficult to see how you could be deemed to be that. I suppose this is where you get to the extreme circumstances where if you've dug out an entire mine and you're left with pillars standing. I suppose this is another point. You're left with pillars standing to support the mine. You're possessing the pillars within the dugout. But isn't it a question of what rights you're asserting? If you occupy the field, in my Lord's example, with a tree in the middle, you may expressly or implicitly be taken to assert the right, among other things, to cut that tree down. Likewise, with the minerals underneath the field, you may be expressly or implicitly asserting the right to extract those minerals. Now, whether you actually cut the tree down makes no difference. Likewise, it makes no difference whether you actually extract the minerals. It's not about rights, it's about physical control. Um, it's not about asserting rights, it's about asserting possession. Uh, and you can, well, you can see this in starting point is Powell and Farlane, it comes up in multiple cases thereafter. So Powell and Farlane, uh, which is in bundle 3 at tab 46. master of all these areas. It really was. Um, what's really impressive is how he manages to distill various different concepts into you know, seminal just, um, or leading judgment. Now, Paolo McFarlane was, um, your lordships may be aware of it, there's a field that's bought that's growing Christmas trees and the purchaser <coughs> of it disappears off for 11 or 16 years because he's a civil servant and has to leave the country and come back decades later. And while he's gone, one of his neighbours starts using a cow, uh, grazing a cow and so on and so forth. Anyway, the facts are not wildly interesting, or not what they are interesting, but not wildly relevant. If you turn to page 470, you get the starting point of the, of the leading cases on 
today on adverse possession. Page 417, about two thirds of the way down, you start with some numbered paragraphs. <coughs> Convenient to begin by restating a few basic principles related to the concept of possession in English law. One, don't worry about. Two, if the law is to attribute possession of land to a person who can establish no paper title to possession, it must be shown to have both factual possession and the requisite intention to possess. And it's positive. Three, factual possession signifies an appropriate degree of physical control. So it's not about asserting rights, it's about physical control. And it goes on, well, it must be a single... So sorry to interrupt you when you're in the middle of reading the case, but while the, while the question is in my mind, why can the one not connote the other? Because if you say, I'm entitled to and I'm going to cut down this tree, you are asserting physical control. No, it's a statement on an act. I can say I'm going to possess Buckingham Palace and I'm not actually doing it. Until I take the act that is asserting physical control, there isn't anything being done that I can be ejected from. It's a threat, not an action. Now, it may go, your statement of intention may go towards the animus procedendi, right. and, and, and that does come up shortly. But until you do the thing, your assertion of a right is not in itself factual possession. You have to do something that does it. Well, now, I, I quite see that the, there's, there's a difference between the, the intention to possess and factual possession, and that's clear and that was approved in the Pine case. Um, but what I'm struggling with is that one may not be relevant to the other. So if you have, going back to my Lord's example, you have factual possession um, of the surrounding field. Yeah. The fact that you're then in a position to cut down the tree um, <coughs> may be sufficient to have physical control over. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, but it's going to be very difficult. It is going to be possible to have physical control over a subset. But it's not going to be easy. For one thing, until you've actually dug it out, the owner, assuming they have rights of access and rights of extraction, can come along and extract it. They can do it horizontally, they can do it vertically, they can do it from underneath. It's rather different with a tree in the middle of a field. If you're controlling the field, they can't get to Uh, carries on. Factual possession signifies an appropriate degree of physical control. It must be a single. It says conclusive. That was um, interpreted in J.A. Pi as exclusive possession. Although there can be a single possession exercised by on behalf of several persons. Thus, an owner of land and a person intruding on that land without his consent cannot both be in possession of the land at the same time. That's one of the one of the distinctions between surface areas and subsurface. It's easy to identify that a surface area owner has been effectively excluded by the actual possession of the surface by the trespasser. Until the trespasser has actually dug out the mineral, the solid, much more difficult to see that they are not in exactly the same position vis-a-vis -vis the unextracted mineral. That is a real problem for saying that there is exclusive, single and exclusive possession. If, until that time has happened, you're in the same place, how does that work? And at some point, possibly at the end of this, I'll come back and, and, and refer to, uh, I think it's come up already in the authorities that I took your lordships to a few minutes ago. Until that's done, the owner is um, in exactly that same possession uh, position. Uh, and that was, I think, might be uh, Donald McKinty. Ah, 
can't find it. There was, there was. I know there's a reference to, in one of the authorities to saying that until that time, uh, until that time happens, the original owner is in exactly the same position as they were before. <coughs> So while we're physically at Powell and McFarlane, I will carry on with the uh, with the authority simply simply because it's useful. To me. Uh, da -da -da. Thus, an owner of a, per a land, a person intruding on that land without his consent, cannot both be in possession of the land at the same time. The question: What acts constitute a sufficient degree of exclusive physical control? Must depend on the circumstances, in particular the nature of the land and the manner in which land of that nature is commonly used. And there you have another problem with possession of subsurface. As I flagged up in the earlier cases, possession or use and enjoyment of minerals of mines of subsurfaces and so on is often not exercised for years at a time. What you're doing is you're holding on to the rights to get to them and to extract them and so on. And if that is how it is normally done, then the owner is sitting there unchanged in their position, as is the trespasser to the unextracted materials. It goes on. Uh, in the case of open land, absolute physical control is normally impracticable, if only because it's generally impossible to secure every part of the boundary so as to prevent an intrusion. What is a sufficient degree of sole possession and use must be measured according to an objective standard related, no doubt, to the nature and situation of the land involved, but not subject to variation according to the resources or status of the claimants. So, uh, clearly settled that acts of possession done on parts of land to which a possessory title is sought may be evidence of possession of the whole. Whether or not acts of possession done on parts of an area established title to the whole area must, however, be a matter of degree. They must also, I, I say, be a matter of quality. So both a qualitative and a quantitative assessment. Does it, in itself, as of its nature, indicate possession of the whole? And also, in its quantum, indicate possession, sufficient to indicate and therein, coming back to this point, if you put up, a f if, for example, the Williams Wynn trustees sought to access a part of the Forestry Commission of Natural Resources Wales land to dig out some minerals, and they were refused entry, that could be an action possessing that mineral. They could say you're not entitled. That might be possible. And I can see that that would be equivalent of fencing off the field and putting a padlock on somebody else's gate is a classic example. But merely digging in one area doesn't stop the Williams Wynn trustee estate coming in and extracting minerals from another one, right next to where it is. It's not an unambiguous action. But may it not be said that the facts come broadly speaking, within the example given at the end of that subparagraph by Mr. Justice Slade, everything must depend on the particular circumstances, but broadly, dot, 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 the alleged possessor has been dealing with the land in question, as an occupying owner might have been expected to deal with it, and that no one else has done so. Now, I may it not be said that the various activities over the years of the Forestry Commission and predecessors in title, in relation to the mudstone, on the estate for purposes connected with the afforestation do in practice qualify as something that an occupying owner might have been expected to do in relation to the mudstone using the land for that purpose and that nobody else has done that. The bits that they've extracted, literally the few inches for a road or the quarry stone. Well, maybe a lot more than a few inches, yeah. it might be a whole slice of the side of a hill. Slice of the side of a hill, but whatever part they've extracted for the road and whatever part they've extracted Yes, but it doesn't mean that they have been acting in dealing with the land in question, the whole of the material, all the way down and all the way across. Well, isn't that then a matter of evidence, as you, I mean, you, you accept, indeed, as Mr. Justice Slade says at 10 lines above, whether or not acts of possession done on parts of an area established title to the whole must be a matter of degree. So is that then not a matter for the trial judge to assess on the evidence? No, because... You have a distinction between whether or not those acts can be a possession of the whole, as opposed to whether or not those acts can physically possess something. So you have a field, you walk around in it, you're possessing the field. But if you have a lump of, of coal 
you dig out a bit, you're physically possessing that lump of coal, but you're not physically possessing the remainder of it. It's a difficulty with solid. Well, that surely, again, is going to be very fact-dependent, isn't it? I mean, if you actually have a seam of coal which just happens to break the surface at some point, and you begin attacking it and using it and exploiting it, but don't get any further, may it not be said, as of finding a fact in appropriate circumstances, that you thereby evince an intention to take possession of the whole of the seam? Well, first of all, we have a case where specifically that happened. It was found that this was not an intention. This was not sufficient. For well, possession. that was held on the facts of that case. On I mean, the facts is, of that is case. It a, it's not well, a proposition of law, is it? It, it can't. But it's how do you control this? If if you are doing something, this is that statement at the end of that of that paragraph is in the context of signifies an appropriate degree of physical control. Yeah. Okay. Now, in that context. I think that it must be shown as constituting pressure possession is that the alleged possessor has been dealing with the land in question as an occupying owner, have been expected to deal with it, and no one else has done so. Is an iteration of physical control, an appropriate degree of physical control. It is not a separate rule, it's an example of how that rule might operate. And that has to be the case. Because if you're not in physical control of something, you're not occupying it, if you're not occupying it, how can you be ejected? And it still comes down to adverse possession. Your time runs for when you can be ejected. And if you're not physically controlling this land, if you're not occupying it in some meaningful way, then you can't have that property repossessed. And that's, that last sentence there must be taken in the context of whether a way of assessing whether or not there is an appropriate degree of physical control. Now in most cases, on surface land, that will probably be a very good means of assessing it. Isn't, isn't that sentence saying, if I may say so, the opposite of what you just said? It's putting what seems on the face of it to be a very rational statement of what the principle actually is. And the principle is that it's what the alleged possessor has been dealing with as an occupying owner might have been expected to do. That seems like a very straightforward and simple proposition of what the, what the characterization of whatever it is that has to be done is. It's whatever the occupying owner might have been expected to do. And yes. in many, many cases, it'll be physical possession. But, but stated as a legal principle, it doesn't have to be physical possession necessarily. What it has to be is whatever it is an occupying owner might be. Right. Two things. First of all, it has to be physical control okay. rather than possession. Secondly, it's occupying owner. Mm -hmm. How do you occupy something that's solid? That's a real fundamental problem. Right. You can occupy something that's a space by being within that space. But to occupy a solid is a logical impossibility. So when he says, when the Mr. Justice Slade says, everything must depend on particular circumstances. So this isn't this isn't a principle, this is an extra, this is an example of the principle. Everything must depend on particular circumstances, but broadly, again, not a legal principle, but an example of how the principle works. I think what must be shown as constituting factual possession is that the alleged possessor has been dealing with the land in question as an occupying owner. Now people don't occupy subsurface. You get deemed possession of it if you're the paper type. You don't occupy it. You occupy void. You control the tree because you surround it and you can't get to it or you can get to it. If, if you controlled access to mines and minerals that might be a, a demonstration and, and denied access for others that would be a demonstration that you were controlling. But until that you haven't got occupation, you haven't got physical control of those minerals. And it is, it's a difficult conceptual problem for adverse possession of solids. There aren't many cases on this because it's quite difficult to do. It's quite rare to do as well. And that's your uh, fact 
actual possession, which, which then gets repeated. It's, I mean, this passage is approved in um, J. A. Pi at paragraph 41, and, and there's another. Should we, should we have a look at that? Um, I don't recall off the top of my head whether it was added to or qualified. Um, it was very, very slightly qualified. Paragraph 40, so it's tab 47, J. A. Pi. Uh, paragraph 41, I think. Yes. The, an abbreviated paragraph. And you'll see that the only slight quality, it's, it's, it's not the entire thing, but um, it's got the parts that we've been discussing. Uh, and the only real amendment to it is uh, factual possession signifies an appropriate degree of physical control. It must be single and exclusive possession. So a gloss rather than a correction. Now, it's quite limited in JAPI because that's all that was necessary in the present case. They were in occupation of the land, which was in their exclusive physical control. So I'm, I'm a little puzzled, because I've seen this case before, but I can't now remember. The word exclusive is put in square brackets, not in the original. Does he explain somewhere um, why he's substituted that um, You know, off the cuff, I can't remember, I think. Um, I suspect he thought it was a typo. I mean, that, that was... Yes, I think, I think it's, you, read, you read the whole of the paragraph, and it, it's, it's clear that what meant is excluding the paper title owner, excluding the world at large. Well, um, to be that, sure, that's logical. I was just wondering if he'd actually spelt that out somewhere. I don't think... I mean, it's a fairly common convention to correct a typo you know, yes. by putting the word that yes. should have been, you think, was obviously meant in square brackets. And yes, and, and in fact, you know, later on in, in, in subparagraph three of Powell and McFarlane, it talks about what is a sufficient degree of sole possession and user must be measured according to the objective standard, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's just a typo correction, possibly, or an extrapolation or a gloss. Yeah, all right, thank you. I mean, with the judge as careful as Mr. Justice Slade, even the typo is a bit implausible. But one knows, one knows how these things can slip through. <laughs> yes, anybody can be subject to typos, my lord. Something well, like <laughs> I hold dear to my heart. Um, and then that, that passage is um, repeated. I mean, again, it's repeated in, in, in Tab 47, Smith against Waterman, a paragraph 18. Uh, and then, ultimately, probably the next most useful thing is Robertson Swangrove Estates at tab 49. That's paragraph... Paragraph 40. Paragraph 40, yes. <clears throat> uh, so Robertson Swangrove was the... My learned friend was in, in this case, um, Mr. Wanacott, uh, was the extraordinary case of thousands of acres of um, foreshore and multiple claims dating back to 1200s uh, and so on. Anyway, the, they decided to deal with adverse possession before they got into proving title, fortunately. And uh, you get at paragraph 40 this particular part of the judgment dealing with um, factual possession. Now, in my judgment, the authorities well support the defendant's submission that factual possession signifies an appropriate degree of physical control having the following characteristics. Now, I would add in some sub-numbering here. One, or that, namely one, that it must be a single and exclusive possession, though there can be a single possession exercise on behalf of several persons jointly. Uh, that if the squatter is in possession, the paper owner cannot be. So a declaration that you're going to do something isn't going to suffice for that. Two, that what acts constitute a sufficient degree of exclusive physical control must depend on the circumstances, including in particular the nature of the land and the manner in which land of that nature is commonly used or enjoyed. Now, that's I'm going to come back to you in a moment as, as a particularly fundamental problem with minerals and subsurface. Uh, three, I would add in there, that what must be shown as constituting factual possession is that the alleged possessor has been dealing with the land in question as an occupying owner might have been expected to deal with it and that no one else has done so. 
and the factual possession must be sufficiently clear that if the owner was present on the land, he would appreciate the squatter was dispossessing. That last sentence is supported by Powell at 480, where he says, in view of the drastic results of change of possession, however, a person seeking to dispossess an owner must, in my judgment, at least make his intention sufficiently clear so that the owner, if present at the land, would clearly appreciate that the claim is not merely a persistent trespasser, but is actually seeking to dispossess him. Now, if you jump back to two, that what acts constitute a sufficient degree of physical, exclusive physical control must depend on the circumstances, including, in particular, the nature of the land and the manner in which land of that nature is commonly used or enjoyed. <coughs> you get to the other problem about subsurface minerals and solids. You use and enjoy them by extraction. And extraction is almost inevitably going to be. I can think of certain other situations, but use and enjoy primarily by extraction. And as has been pointed out in cases going back to the 1800s, this regularly doesn't take place for long periods of time. So it's not as though one person not extracting material in location X is in any way contrary to somebody else not extracting material in location X. You put up barriers to prevent them, that might be different. But merely extracting one particular plot <coughs> is not going to be exclusive physical control of another. And then you come, I mean, and I will get back to the question of uh, matter of fact and degree uh, shortly. And then you, come, you, you, of course, come to the next point about whether or not digging a number of quarries and a certain number of roads is ever going to actually extend to A, the vertical below the depth in which it was extracted, and B, the horizontal of mm. thousands of acres. But that's, but that's if you get to the point where this could be possession of the other map of the other matter, materials. And but, but why can you not exercise the requisite degree of control um, treat dealing with the land in question as an occupier might have been expected to deal with it yeah. by virtue of your exclusive possession of the surface? Right. Because as long as you're just occupying the surface and you're not doing anything to stop someone coming in and exercising their rights of access to the minerals and their rights of extraction. You haven't done anything that's adverse, you haven't done anything to possess it, to, to, to control it. So suppose you have, suppose you own Blackacre which is a donut ring around Whiteacre and, you, and somebody has a right of access across your land to Whiteacre. The owner of Whiteacre has a right of access across your land. The fact that you are con you're surrounding it doesn't mean that you possess it. If you put a fence around it or stop them coming across your land... Well, I understand that, but you see, the difficulty that we're confronting here arises out of the artificiality, which is well, legally well established. It goes back to as we've seen. You can separate title to the surface of land from title to what is below the surface. Hmm. I mean, if you if you couldn't separate title in that way, the problem wouldn't arise. Yes. So here, we are postulating a situation where title to the surface of the land is on paper in the hands of party A, and on paper, title to that which is below the surface is in the hands of party B. And therefore, the, that's where the, the context which one has to ask oneself whether what party A is doing is sufficient to dispossess party B of party B's paper title in circumstances where it's a paper title to that which is below the land. Mm. Yes. Now, your argument is that, well, you've got to show that you have possessed the minerals below the surface yes understand that but what i'm struggling with is why you can't demonstrate the requisite degree of control 
through your ownership of the surface. You, you could, depending on how you use the surface. You could, ex when, when the mineral owner comes along and says, this week I want to dig, into your, dig through your land and extract my material, you could say, they're my, my minerals, and I'm not going to let you on to do that. But again, it would be quite tricky to say that you were in possession of those minerals. Put it another way. Suppose a, you have a severed surface and subsurface title. A squatter who occupies and possesses the surface still doesn't get adverse possession of the subsurface. Because possession of the surface is not possession of the subsurface, and it's not if you're not the actual title holder of the subsurface, it's not even deemed possession of the subsurface. It is, I, I can't <clears throat> exclude the possibility that there are manners in which occupying the surface is going to constitute physical control of the minerals. But they're going to be something more than just use of, normal use of the surface. I mean, another unusual aspect, I mean, this case is unusual in all sorts of ways, but the unusual aspect of the facts is that the, the acts relied on by the defendant, you know, really relate to points where the bedrock is either at or just below the surface. And so from that point of view, I mean, it's, it's natural to look at what is going on on the surface by the surface owner uh, if one gets into this territory at all. I mean, if one get, first of all, if one gets the territory at all, but well, secondly, let's assume against you that you, one does. <coughs> yeah, 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 you, absolutely. You've right. accepted as a theoretical yeah, 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 possibility. Um, but if you are looking, if that is the case, mm. then it's going to be limited to just a little bit of the surface. Well, I mean, that then that's I can say. Well, I uh, hear your assertion, but why? Because if your actions are, if you're looking at the surface to control the surface, because the bedrock is right up against the surface, why would that extend to any, anywhere significantly below it? Well, if it shows, a, as I was perhaps suggesting a short while back, um, if it shows a consistent intention to exercise dominion over the bedrock as and when opportunity presents itself in a way which is going to forward your own interests as the surface landowner um, by making it easier to grow trees or whatever it is you happen to be doing, is it not then just a question of evidence? No. If you're looking at it because of how you're operating on the surface, then the nature, and <clears throat> the nature of what you are doing, and this, this, this would at that stage be a question of degree and nature of the, of the locality. Mm. What you are doing on the surface is a surface type action, and it's only going to extend to within the, the near parameters of the surface. It's never going to go back down further. And it's going to depend on precisely what sort of actions we're talking about. And then you come to, <clears throat> I am slightly jumping ahead of myself, but it's a useful place to put it. Isn't it? You come to the actions which are put forward in this case, which is quarrying and road building, or road construction slash maintenance. Now quarrying, if we are to the point at which saying, saying you can the bit that you've extracted can indicate that you're possessing elsewhere. If you can do that, I can see that a quarry, which is in a specific locale, can take you down because you are digging down into it. And that's the action. The action which you are taking is designed to dig down and extract material. But if you're road building, <coughs> first of all, it's a very specific, narrow strip that is of limited depth. And it's limited because it's the nature of road building dig down forever, you mm. just dig down what is necessary. So it's limited depth. And here's the other point. <clears throat> if you want to, so it can't extrapolate downwards by the very nature of it. It's not claiming anything more. And you can't extrapolate outwards either. Because all you are doing is doing a horizontal strip or line. And you can't build roads literally everywhere. It's an act of trespass claims that bit of the land. 
You are never, when in forestry terms, never going to build 100% of the land with roads because you can't, at that point, perform forestry. By its very nature, it cannot be extrapolated to the rest of the land. But is that what matters? Um, because if you behave in a way that shows you <coughs> consider yourself entitled to build a road anywhere on the land, why does it matter that you only choose to put it in parcel B rather than in parcel A? For a start, if it's ambiguous, you don't get it. And it has to be unequivocal. Yeah. <coughs> And then, in our particular case, well, second point is, if you look at the actual authorities on uh, extrapolation by means of recognising the common character of locality, uh, whilst we're on Swangrove and Roberts, um, if we jump forward to paragraphs 63 and 64, <coughs> Or actually start at, um, uh, hang on for a second. Yeah, possibly start at page, uh, paragraph 57, where there's a rather useful quote from Lord Blackburn in Lord Advocate against Lord Blantyre. Um, I was talking about the foreshore and banks of the River Clyde. And he talks about every act shown to have been done on any part of that tract by the barons or their agents, which was not lawful unless the barons were owners of that spot on which it was done. It's evident that they were in possession of owners of that, sp uh, <coughs> of that spot on which it was done. No one such act is conclusive. The weight of each act of evidence depends on the circumstances. One very important circumstance is the weight being whether the act was such and so done that those who were interested in disputing the ownership would be aware of it. And all that tends to prove possession of as owners of parts of the tract tends to prove ownership of the whole tract goes on, provided there is a common character of locality as would raise a reasonable inference that if the barons possessed one part as owners, they possessed the whole, the weight depending on the nature of the tract, what kind of possession could be had of it, and what the kind of possession proved was. Here, we say that what kind of possession, it, you can possess it by extracting it. And if you haven't extracted it, you haven't possessed it. The nature of the tract this is forest land and you're building a road. But it slips between one forest area, a clear area, and another forest area. So it doesn't extend beyond the, the necessary next door, next pot of land at the very minimum. And what the kind of possession proves was. And in this particular case, in our case, it's a matter of digging down the bedrock, or digging into the bedrock by a few inches, or digging into the side of the, side of the, of the hill. It's not claiming that substantial piece of land over there. And if you're going to claim the whole of it, think about what, what this is extending to. You build a road here, are you actually claiming down to the centre of the earth and over to the edge of your title? It is, just as a matter of degree, grossly excessive. And I watch time going by. So on that matter of, I, I will come back to that matter of degree in a few minutes, but Turning over the pages, paragraph 60. Then, after citing the passage, I've already cited from Lord Blackburn's speech and Lord Advocate and Blantyre. So, Harry continues, this is in the case of Higgs and Mass Albion. Rule is not applicable to a question of undefined and disputed boundary. But, and again, you've got a problem here because how far down does it go in terms of possession? Does it go a few inches? Does it go a few metres? If it's undefined and disputed, this is a problem. But this does not mean that acts done on one part of the land are only relevant to prove possession of the whole if the land is enclosed by a wall or other physical barrier. The property claimed by possession may be sufficiently defined in other ways, e.g. where the claim is to trees and a belt of woodland. That's the next problem with this. How far down are you going? And the judge in this particular case said sufficient depth for normal surface use. Well, that's undefined. Oh, it's, it's defined, but it's ambiguous, uncertain. 
Well, on that point, what do you say about paragraph 64? Now, ah, getting to that. So can we go back to 63 first before going to 64? So 63, there's ample authority for the proposition that acts on one part of an area, note that area, two-dimensional, may be treated as continuing possession for the whole area, provided there is such common character of locality as would raise a reasonable Uh, reasonable inference that if a person was possessed of one part of the area, so possessed the whole of it, mainly the principle has been applied to rivers, nothing about an area being frequently entirely covered with water and not having visibly marked out boundaries where it adjoins other waters is denies its application. There will nowadays be many cases in which he who was in possession requires planning, environmental, or other permission if he is to use the land he possesses as he might wish. Quarrying, open cast mining, and dredging come to mind as examples where it may be only on limited parts and over a period of years that the squatter can conduct operations on the land he possesses. Right, and note that it's quarrying, open cast mining, and dredging, which are surface activities, not mines and minerals, in terms of underground activities. Now, you can claim the surface of that. You're excluded from dredging this particular area for six months of the year, but it's okay because you dredge it for the other six months of the year. The fact that it's temporarily interrupted doesn't mean that you're not actually claiming possession. But it is interesting that it's quarrying, open cast mining, and dredging rather than mining. And note also, it's over a period of years that the squatter conduct operations on the land he possesses, the land, the area he possesses. Unless a practical view is taken of possession of part, representing possession of the whole, there will be many cases in which acquisition of the whole by actual possession would be impossible. And that, but suppose we take the expression that he uses, quarrying, open cast mining and dredging, and substitute quarrying and road building. You can possess the whole of the bit of the road that you that you dug. The, the, the actual bit that you carved out, you can possess that. Just like you can possess the whole of the quarry that you have dug out, even if you're not allowed to dig this bit this week, you're digging the other, you're, you're digging the north side, not the south side. You still possess the whole of the quarry. And just like if you're repairing mile one of the road, and you're not repairing mile two this week, if you've done it, you might extend it that far. But you, you've got to do it. And the fact that you're only going to be doing that periodically isn't going to be a problem for you. The periodical nature of it is not an issue. That's what paragraph 64 is saying. And the fact that you've built the road this year and you don't use it for, and you don't touch it for another 20 years and then you come back and repair it doesn't mean that you're not possessing it during that time because it's the nature of how you build that road but it doesn't get you any further than the road If you, on that issue, turn to the judgment, call bundle tab A, and it's paragraph well, it starts paragraph 67, and this is the, the section on forest infrastructure roads and tracks. Paragraph 67. So we have a very large area of land. We say that, and this is what they get to. 67. There are a mixture of forest roads and tracks. Mr. Sherrod's been informed by the defendant there are around 103 miles of forest roads, but it was unclear how much of this was located on the titles in question. We don't even know it's 103 miles. However, as can be seen from the land registry plans, which are based on ordnance survey maps, there are also a significant number of other tracks. Land registry plans for all but one title show at least one road or track, and in many cases, multiple tracks. That doesn't really assist because <coughs> they 
gave their evidence saying these are the roads that we built. And there may be other tracks, but they may or may not have been maintained or upgraded. And even if they had been maintained or upgraded, who knows whether or not those tracks would involve extraction or reserve materials. So with that, you then turn on to paragraph 74. And this is the height of the evidence in support of their position. 74, although he had no direct knowledge of the sites in dispute, Mr. Wallace, one of the defendant's witnesses, evidence is also of some relevance to this issue. He said that in a fully roaded mature forest, the roads with their bends, junctions, banks, and unplanted verges will be deemed to account for 15% of the forest area. Although this obviously includes unplanted areas on either side of the road, it gives some idea of the likely scale of the road and track network. And in fact, um, Mr. Wallace's evidence, which is in supplementary bundle B at tab 18, at paragraph 26, Paragraph 26, about halfway down the page, uh, the paragraph, halfway down the page. Starting, the roads were, so far as I am, the auditors were aware, deemed to be part of the infrastructure of a working forest. Open bracket. The forest road network is generally very extensive, and in a mature forest, which is fully roaded, question mark whether all these are, the roads with their bends, junctions, drains, batters, and banks, as well as the roadside verge or unplanted forest edge, would be deemed to account for 15% of the forest area or so, if it's fully roaded and it's a forest area, which isn't proved on this particular case, it's going to be 15% including roadside verge or unplanted forest edge, which is again not going to be extraction of material. The unplanted roadside edge was particularly important to ensure that light could reach the forest road surface, which is a waterbound macadam construction would be severely weakened if the growing trees cast a permanent shadow over the roads, preventing them from drying out. So you've got an area of unplanted uh, land, but not road, to either side, uh, which is not going to be, again, extraction material. So you're going from 15% to less, to less, to less. We have an uncertain small proportion of the land dealt with by means of, or covered by, roads, and as to whether or not those roads were in involved in uh, interference with the reserve materials, it's absolutely unclear. And that's why we say, as a matter of degree, simply, you cannot extrapolate from such narrow bands of such uncertain nature and length, depth, width, to the entirety of all of the, all of the titles in dispute. It is an unreasonable, in the Wed Wednesbury sense, an unreasonable extrapolation. <coughs> I mean, it's not a public law question, so maybe Windsor isn't quite the right label, but effectively all saying is, it, insofar as it's a, an overall conclusion of fact, are you saying it's an impossible conclusion to reach on the law, or just it's one which goes beyond the reasonable latitude open to any judge on an issue of fact? That. It, 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 it's, it's effectively that. Um, because, well, okay, it's not, it's not quite that. It is that when assessing, as a matter of degree, that this is evidence of uh, of adverse possession of the entirety of their land. That was wrong in law. And this is ground 4-1. The learned judge urged in law and was wrong to hold, one, that digging into mudstone to construct a road or track to construct ramps to allow harvesting to or extract material from a quarry or borrow pit, and this is paragraph 150 of the judgment, constituted adverse possession of the entirety of the claimant's land beyond that directly under those locations, being either 
the subsoil of the defendant's specific title where the left action took place, so straight down, or the subsoil of the defendant's contiguous title. Well, I go on to say, or two, that digging into mudstone to construct a road track or construct ramps to allow harvesting constitute adverse possession of the subsoil at all, or the one down in paragraph 170 of the judgment of the subsoil below the level of actual interference. That's the point about you dig out, you extract, fine, but you can't say that you possess anything more. Now, the ground five, the judge erred in law and was wrong to hold, alternatively the learned uh, judge made an error of fact, that it was proved on the balance of probabilities that there was disturbance to mudstone in subsoil in every forested area, the subject of a claim. And that's my point about, you've got 15%, you don't know where the roads are, you don't know if the tracks are there. This is a, a possibility on an uncertainty. You can't prove it on the balance of probability. Now, the other, in addition to quarries and, and quarrying and road building, the last point which seems to have been made by the judge was that if you dig, or sorry, if you plant trees, if you engage in forestry, plant, that constitutes an act of adverse possession. And that's paragraphs 168 to 169 of the judgment. Again, this is just a question of what acts can constitute adverse possession. And you'll see this, paragraph 168 of the judgment. I accept the quarries do not exist in every area, and that the defendant has not provided definitive evidence there are forest roads or tracks that have been cut into the bedrock in every area. Problem. However, at the very least, there will have been disturbance to mudstone in subsoil, and consistent with the finding of 77 above, I consider it more likely than not that by now at least some disturbance to the bedrock will have occurred in every forested area of the subject of the claim. I'll come back to 77 in a moment. In every such area, at least some forest roads or tracks will need to have been constructed or improved to allow mechanised planting. There isn't the evidence of that. Trees must in many places have themselves encroached on the subsoil. And for the reasons I discussed with my Lord Justice Arnold this morning about roots and planting, that's not adverse possession. You plant something in the soil, if its roots go down, that's not adverse possession by you. If for no other reason, if it's far from an unambiguous action, that you're claiming possession of that land, it's a tree growing. In every such area, da, 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 an objective informed observer would appreciate that additional activity would typically be required for harvesting, if not for thinning. It's going to happen in the future, but it hasn't happened now. And this bit, 169, by planting, the defendant's statutory predecessor was manifesting an intention to take whatever steps it needed to take to harvest in due course. And the informed observer would be aware that that would be highly likely to require further disturbance to the subsoil, and in many cases, to the bedroom. What you are going to do in the future is not an act of dispossession today. For one thing, you can do it in many different ways. You could get a license. Importantly, this intention will be manifest as regards the whole forested area. Again, intention, not action. No such observer would consider that the actions taken by the defendants and statutory predecessors were equivocal. We, obviously, for the reasons already outlined, we disagree. And furthermore, in all areas, some harvesting activity is likely to likely to have occurred already. Read with the last sentence of 70, 72 and last sentence of 71. If roads or tracks have not previously been cut into bedrock, then the additional activity required for harvesting is likely to have required it at least to some extent. Again, what extent? How far? We're talking about matter of degree. That's an important part of the question. And then paragraph 77, just to flag this up, um, and this is quite a substantial problem if it's a matter of degree. Paragraph 77, page 100 of the bundle, there's no evidence of the precise extent to which it would have been necessary to cut into the bedrock on a title's industry. Mr. Sherratt suggested that in most cases, not all, but most, it would be necessary to dig into the bedrock to some degree. Doesn't say how much. Bearing in mind the hilly terrain, the thinness of the soil and subsoil, and the need to accommodate heavy machinery, I accept Mr. Sherratt's evidence. It doesn't say how much, where, how long, and again, this comes back to, you've got a number of places where it's dug into the bedrock to an uncertain degree. That is not sufficient to claim thousands of acres of, of subsoil. Mm -hmm. 
the point about whether or not building a road is an equivocal or unequivocal act of possession is made good and highlighted, we say, by the issue of animus possidendi, the second part element of adverse possession. And Sorry, I'm going to stop. I'm going to jump back to the last. I'm just finishing off on the last thing that I was doing while we still got the judgment in hand. Um, the last par paragraph 151 of the judgment is where the judge deals with determining the relevant geographical area. Page 119. Yes. One issue that arises is how the area of the relevant title is to be determined. Mr. Moran submitted that I should consider the question by reference to defendants' individual registered titles because details of these would be available to the objective informed observer, referred to in Parliament above. However, this doesn't take account of the fact that before two, around 2005, the defendant's title was unregistered. Well, no, but they've still got a title. Um, and it claims that adverse possession was established well before that. More importantly, it doesn't reflect the fact that adverse possession would be against the claimant's paper title, which is unregistered. I therefore preferred Mr. Wanakoff's submission that it's the area of the claimant's title that should be the focus defendant's title to the surface. And we say that's fundamentally wrong. Because if you're looking at the nature of the act that you're performing, if you are a surface owner and you are digging into soil, it must be the case that if your actions are to be interpreted as possessing, it's going to be possessing because you claim title to it as the surface owner and the mineral owner. Unless you somehow claim to be having claiming title to it under a separate title, any objective observer be seeing you as claiming that as an extension of your title. If you don't approach it that way, you come up with an enormous immediate problem. Suppose you own Black Acre, which is one acre in the middle of a thousand acres, where all the subsurface is owned by the Bishop of Durham, and you dig out against the Bishop of Durham's single title of thousands of acres. Are you claiming possession to anything outside your own title? It's absurd to suggest that. It must be by reference to your title. And certainly, in terms of equivocal or unequivocal actions, at best it's going to be by reference And that actually made quite a specific difference in our case, because at paragraph 153, the judge found that in fact, Williams Wynn Estate has a single title derived from ownership as Lord of the Relevant Manor. Now, if that is the case, and they say, aha, we're digging out here and we have adverse possession against our bits, why doesn't it go elsewhere? Where's the end of it? Cannot be correct. And then at paragraph 164, I'm just going to drop one last time before moving on to the uh, before moving on to uh, animus possidendo. Paragraph 164, and this is an example of the problems with this uh, qualitative analysis, matter of degree. Turning to Mr. Moran's other points, I do not accept there is a meaningful difference in this context between forest roads and tracks on the one hand and quarries and borrow pits on the other. I found as a fact that in most cases it is necessary to cut into the bedrock to some degree to construct roads and tracks. Quarrying is usually into the hillside in the same way for side roads and tracks. Whatever may have been the defendant's belief about paper title ownership at the time, the objective manifestation is similar. It really isn't. And again, if you are exercising this for the purposes of extrapolating out, of seeing whether there's a common characteristic in the locality, so that an act in one place can claim possession elsewhere. That nature of the act of building a road is fundamentally different from the nature of digging a quarry. One is doing it to provide a, a, a road. The other is doing it to extract minerals. Material.
Given the way time is passing, I'm going to move on to Ernest Posse Dendi. Yes, thank you. Intention to possess. Now, this is important in a couple of ways, but the, the starting point is um, you have to have both. Well, if I can take you to um, Smith and Waterman, which is in Authorities Bundle 3, tab 48. It's, it, it's stated in Powell and McFarlane, but this is a, a nice way of putting it in Smith and Waterman, tab 48. Paragraph 19. By the way, I apologise for swigging straight out of the bottle. It's just we haven't got any glasses because of COVID restriction. That's fine, Mr. Moran. <laughs> Enormously grateful. I suddenly felt very embarrassed. Anyway, <laughs> 19. The animus possidente, perhaps better referred to these days as the intention to possess, involves, as Slade J describes in Powell's case, and that's quoted by Bramwell Cotton in Pye's case, an intention in one's own name and on one's own behalf to exclude the world at large, including the owner with the paper title, if he be not himself the possessor, so far as is reasonably practical, <coughs> and so far as the process of the law will allow. So there are two elements to this. One, a subjective intention to possess, which involves showing that the trespasser actually had the requisite intention to possess. And two, some outward manifestation of the trespasser's subjective intention, which makes clear that intention to the world at large. Now, subjective, what did they intend to possess? Objective, how was that manifested? And the, this is important because of the way that they dealt with mineral rights when they realised there was a problem with mineral rights. Now, it goes on to quote Inglewood Investment Company and Baker, uh, which I'll leave your lordships to read. And then the bit I really want to highlight is the next quote uh, in this actual judgment. In other words, the manifestation of the trespasser's intention to possess must be unequivocal. And then quoting Powell to explain why. Then you get to the last paragraph on that page. It's because of its equivocal nature that an act such as repairing the fencing around a field in which the trespasser is grazing his animals is usually regarded as an insufficient manifestation of intention to possess. Fence repairs may be done as much to ensure the animals are kept in the field <coughs> as to prevent others from gaining entry into the field. It explains why a padlock gate, if the gate is the customary means of access to the field, is usually a fairly sure indicator of such an intention. It ordinarily signifies an intention to exclude persons, including therefore the true owner, from coming onto the land in question. So, that's your uh, background to Animus Possidendi. The peculiarity of this case, if you can turn to Supplementary Bundle B, is the way that it's, they dealt with the issue of mineral rights. So, in summary, in about 2011 2012, Natural Resources Wales realised that there, in some of their plots there were mineral owners who may have rights to the subsurface. And they conducted a survey, and they ended up putting together a spreadsheet which had warnings, red, amber, and green, depending on whether or not they thought other people had these rights. Where it was red, they ceased quarrying activities. Where it was green, they carried on. But in all of the titles, red, amber, and green, they carried on with the road building. And you can see this, in the, the, the setting out what's going on is a Tab 18, paragraph 45. This is Mr. Wallace's witness statement. Mr. Wallace's witness statement, page 106. <coughs> um, and if you read, I mean, paragraph, if you read paragraphs 45 and 46 just sets out the sort of thing that happened, uh, in fact, how, how the assessment was undertaken. Now, they stopped the quarrying, but they didn't stop the road building areas where there were mineral rights. They didn't see that 
as a potential interference with mineral rights. They saw that as the action of a surface owner, not a subsurface owner. And whilst, yes, they were intending to possess, not own, but possess, the bit that they dug out on each road, it doesn't go further. That's all that they were doing. Now, so there are two things that come out of this. The first is, they could only intend to possess what they were actually digging out. And the second is this. If they thought that this wasn't a problem, it is, we say, strong evidence that these actions were, at the very least, equivocal in terms of claiming possession of anything other than the part being dug out. It's equivocal, it's insufficient. And that's the quote from Pound Parliament. When possession or dispossession is to be inferred from equivocal act, the intention with which they are done is all important. And then, if, again, if his acts are open to more than one interpretation, not made it perfectly plain to the world at large by his actual words that he intended to exclude the owner as best he can, the courts would treat him as not having had the requisite animus possidenda, and consequently as not having dispossessed the owner. Is there evidence that they knew that your position was that they was dispossessing the owner? What they were doing? At the time, we didn't know what was going on. So, no. Um, what happened was that having done the, this is a, a, a very brief encapsulation, having done this survey, I think in 2015, one of the land agents uh, saw that there was a mineral right in one particular plot and wrote to William Tower, William Tower and State, and said, can we do this? And that opened basically a can of worms where the estate came along and said, hang on, you've been doing this all over the place, how much is it? And that brought about this issue. Um, in fact, there had been a couple of times in the past where they'd been digging out for roads. There was one in the 50s where uh, there was a request for permission from the estate to dig out some gravel that resulted in a small license. And I think there was one in 1907 where the council was asking to dig out some, some mudstone uh, to build roads as well. But other than those, I'm not aware of any other times when the estate was aware of this being done. But doesn't, doesn't that equivocal or unequivocalness of the act depend a bit on whether it was even could even be said objective you know, might subjectively in their contemplation it was the thought that the act was uh, a trespass if you like yes if it doesn't look like it's a trespass it's difficult to see how that's an unequivocal act of possession no it may well be an unequivocal act of possession the reason it doesn't look like it from your point of view is that no, they thought no one was daft enough to say that what they were doing was was Breach of someone else's rights, but they certainly thought they had the right to do it. It's a perfectly unequivocal statement that they're entitled to build roads. It just never, the equivocalness only arises from the fact, it seems to me, that, that it never entered their head, perhaps. I don't know, I don't know I'm speculating, I realize that. But when your submission that it's equivocal, it's only because it isn't obvious to them when they're doing it that someone would say that it was an act of possession of someone else's property. But if you're intending to possess it, you have to think, I want to possess that. <clears throat> and if you are taking an action which looks like it is not interfering with other people's rights, or you think is not interfering with other people's rights, it's pretty difficult to say that you're intending to possess it. What you're doing is you're intending to dig this particular road, and you haven't thought about anything else. You haven't thought about anywhere else. Right? So whilst an action can be extrapolated out as a factual possession, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the common locality, common character of the locality. Mm. It doesn't work if you don't have your action here at point one is not in you're not intending to possess point two, three, four, five, six. Well but if but if as a matter of fact, well I'm not gonna put it back over, but if if if, if, if it's a legitimate inference to draw that the fact that you think you can draw, you can build a road anywhere you like is 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 manifested by the fact that you're building roads anywhere you like. It doesn't mean you're building them everywhere. Yeah, you're building yeah. them anywhere you like, uh, rather
rather suggests that you unequivocally think you've got the right to build the new rig. But you're not intending to possess it. You haven't got around to it. You haven't thought of it. Right. It's still subjective. Okay. You just didn't think of it. So you can be an accidental trespasser without intending to possess it. The fact that you might think that you own something mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you intend to possess it or to occupy it. Okay. And again, it comes back to that point about you, you intend to possess a field. That's one thing. You walk in and you, and you exercise your rights around the field. But it's much more difficult to intend to possess a particular mineral over there, a particular solid over there, in a way that is different from digging it out. But is it really right to say this is a question of subjective intention? Surely it's really a matter of just it being making it deliberately manifest to the outside world that you're doing the acts in question. Isn't that, isn't that going to be enough? Well, uh, you I mean, still, here, you still it? have to subjectively intend it. Do you? Yes. 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 It says subjective intention. You have to have a subjective intention. That is. Sorry. Remind me where that is stated in terms. Or... Um. Well, there's Powell and McFarlane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, page four seven one. The intention in one's name and on one's own behalf to exclude the world at large, including the owner with the paper title, if he be not himself the possessor. And then Smith and Waterman, the authority I just took you to, at paragraph nine two, authority tab forty eight. There are two elements to this. A subjective intention to possess, which involves showing the trespasser actually had the requisite intention to possess. Yep, thank you. I mean, I understand your point about whether something is possession at all, but if, if building a road out of and taking the, uh, the mudstone from one bit and squashing it onto the surface to make a surface, if that is possession, then you have the intention to possess it. Yes, but that bit. You don't. Have, what I'm saying is, you don't have the intention to best the other bits. Well, I, what I thought you were talking about was no, no. I don't think that is the point you were making. You were saying that wasn't equivocal. You were saying it was that wasn't an unequivocal act of possession of even the stone of which it, which it was. Concerned. No, sorry, sorry. It was not an unequivocal act. It is an unequivocal act of possession of that, because you do intend to physically possess the bit that you're digging out. Right. You don't. You don't have to in, intend to own it. You just have to intend to possess it. Mm -hmm. But it's not an unequivocal act of possession of anywhere else because you don't, you're not thinking about it. Okay. All, all you're thinking is, I've, I've got the right to do this. I don't need to go off and possess that. Right. But it is, I, I, I do accept it's an unequivocal intention to possess the bit that you're digging out because you intend to dig it out, which is the form of possession. Mm -hmm. In that case, why do you draw a distinction that you drew earlier? With the quarry. I mean, I quite understand you say there's a difference between the bits where they built, actually built the roads and the bits where they didn't build the yes. roads. And that's a very clear point, and it applies both at the level of actual factual possession and at the level of intent to possess. I understand that. Yep. But earlier you, you made a forensic point about the difference in approach of the respondent to quarrying and to road building. Ah. You said, well, with the quarrying, they, they did this traffic light system and they stopped in the red areas, um, but they carried on regardless with the road building. Yes. Therefore, you said, that, well, there's a, therefore a difference between the two. Yes. So, so, this, so that's the point that's eluding me at the right. moment, is, is what you say the relevance of that is. Ah, so that's not relevant to the subject of intention. That's relevant to whether or not your acts are unequivocal to the factual position. And that's because if they but think sorry, that it's I not a problem. You, you, you addressed us on that point after you debarked on animus possidendi and after referring us to Smith and Waterman, which is why I had understood my point to be referable to intent to possess rather than factual possession. No, actually, you're right. It, it, sorry, it is, it is an animus possidendi. Um, I apologise. I got I got. Christy Fine. On that All right. It, um, it's easy to get muddled up in this. I mean, I'm sure I've done it during the course of the day as well. But but now we've established that this is an int a point about animus possidenda. What is the point? Okay. If you have an unequivocal action, or uh, if you have an equivocal action, courts are not going to treat you as re having the re requisite objective animus possidenda. Uh, and well, you that, that I can understand. You, the, the authorities clearly show that Things that are equivocal are not enough. Understood. That's, yes. And that's the point. If they thought that this wasn't a problem in terms of mineral rights, then this is an action 
which, at least from a reasonable perspective of NRW, Natural Resources Wales, does not look like it's interfering with mineral rights. And if that's the case, then this is an equivocal action. Well, I, I can understand that up to a point, except that the evidence you referred to is apparently, I mean, well, I've only read these two paragraphs, obviously, it seems to be about coal mines, because that's how the subject starts, 45, given the existence of coal mines in mines, and then it goes on. So it seems to be about coal mines, but the judge made no finding about adverse possession of coal. Her finding was limited to adverse possession of um, the mudstone, which is an issue in this case. I, I, can, I can expand on that. If you take up bundle uh, C, um, supplementary bundle C, you can get a little bit more of a feel from it, of it from Mr. Wallace's cross-examination. Bundle C, tab 41. I'm oh, sorry, 49. Which tab did you say, Mr. Ta sorry, tab 41. 41. And if you turn to page 540, on the top left, page 49 of the cross of the transcript, um, about halfway down at line 12, Q, that's fine. And this email, 6 of November. And what happens is after they've done their study and they've produced this spreadsheet with red, amber, and, and green, they send out an email to people. This email six million of all. Further to the EMG, yesterday I attached updated spreadsheets of the active FCW borrow pits where we've identified that minerals are reserved out of our title. Working on these borrow pits must cease with immediate effect. And you note my summary conclusions in respect of each borrow pit in the right hand column of the spreadsheet. That's in terms of active borrow pits. Yes. Answer yes. Question Did you ever go back and look at inactive or closed borrow pits? And I say borrow pits meaning borrow pits and quarries. Answer I think you asked me that question because I changed my job in 2013. I have no, I have no knowledge of what happened after the event. Question, okay, it carries on. In some cases we may seek to acquire mineral rights, but in most cases the site needs to be closed and restored. Safety arrangement needs to be put in place in accordance with operational guidance and be agreed between county civil engineer and FEMs. We'll provide, provide further guidance in due course. You said earlier today, this is a public body, you act in proportion in the appropriate manner. The reason for closing off and ceasing with immediate effect any of, I'm going to call them the red borrow pits, red light. Uh, that this is not Forestry Commission owned, correct? Answer. We were taking the view that we could not work any sites, these, those sites any longer and would therefore restore them to comply with quarries legislation. Question. But it talks about closing the quarries. It doesn't mention anything about stopping, and road, stopping road workings or building of new roads, does it? Answer. Well, the new roads being built will have used material from quarries from whatever source. Question. It doesn't talk about stopping new roads being built full stop in those areas, does it? Answer. No, because stone could come from many different sources and stop. Question. And the building answer will be brought in. Question. The building wasn't going to interfere, you believe, with the mineral rights therein? Answer. No. It was part of the normal. As I've said in my statement, the forest roads were part of the normal operation of a forest. Mm. So it started with coal, but they went on to look at all their mineral rights in the situation. Now, they didn't see that. They didn't see road building as interfering with mineral rights. And once you've built a road, it's difficult to tell to what extent it does. So in some cases it won't, in some cases it will. But in terms of actions being unequivocal as an objective manifestation of the animus possidenda, given that they thought that this wasn't it must be the case that there is an equivocal nature in this act. Yeah, but it does rather depend on what mineral rights they had in mind at the time. Because you can understand, if the mineral rights you're thinking about are coal, you can understand why you would think the road building had nothing to do with that. If, by contrast, the mineral rights you have in mind are mudstone, which is only a few inches below the surface, then it's a different story. Yes. Borrow pits. They're the ones by the side of the road where you 
dig down and get some mud stone to make to make the road. So it's got to be that same material. And the quarry. What does the acronym FCW stand for? I don't. At the moment, I don't know. I could have told you a year ago. <laughs> Fair enough. Forestry Commission Wales. Thank you. I've got to whiz through. I'm, I'm eating into my learned friend's time, so I'm going to very quickly deal with, uh, and I'm going to deal with this very quickly because I can deal with it more substantially. There are two points raised. One on Maloney Friend's respondent's notice, which is land registration issues, and one in his skeleton, which is about form of order trial on liability. Um, respondent's notice says that there are a number of titles in which there is an unrestricted title to land registered, which they say therefore includes titles for minerals. We would, f uh, and they identify a number of the titles in particular. Uh, they identify titles. Ah. Lost the blaster thing. There it is. Sorry, this is page 13 of the bundle, of the core bundle, tab 2, A8, C13, D37, D38, C16, C41. Um, A8, I'm going to just very quickly flag this up, A8, the registered title, excludes minerals from the title in the area coloured blue, which is actually the only, only the area that we're interested in, so that's completely out, out of the question. But even for the, all the other titles, there's a very simple answer to this. Well, I say simple answer, that's complete, completely wrong. It's a surprisingly difficult answer, which is this. There isn't any authority, as far as I can tell, on whether or not a title registered without any qualification includes mines and minerals. And if your lordships can take up a little supplementary bundle that I handed up or sent in yesterday. If you turn to tab three, you've got the Law Commission's cons consultation on updating land registration act 2002, which I think was about four years ago. Um, if you turn on in that section, so what, what I've extracted there is the section on mines and minerals in particular, from paragraph 3.15 through to paragraph 3.42. Um, but in particular, if you turn to page 40, paragraphs 3.26 and 3.27, and registration surface title. And what happens is that it may be that the registrar feels comfortable including expressly or excluding expressly minerals, but it may not be either way. 3.26, on first registration of surface land, if the registrar is satisfied that the mines and minerals are included in or excluded from the applicant's title, you must make an appropriate note on the register. And that's under Land Registry Rules 2003 Rule 32. The registrar must also note exceptions and reservations resulting from enfranchisement of copyhold land, and an application for a note must be entered on the register title that the estate includes mines, and minerals must be accompanied by evidence to satisfy the registrar of such an inclusion. 327. In this way, the registrar will only examine title of mines and minerals where the proprietor is applying to have them expressly included with his or her title, or where the proprietor of mines and minerals held apart from the surface land is applying to have that estate registered. These rules imply that the absence of a note on the register either way would be inconclusive as to the ownership of the mines and minerals and any rights in them. The inconclusive nature of the absence of a note is further demonstrated by the fact that Rule 70 of the Land Registration Rules specifies that where the description of the land in question, uh, a land in the property register, includes reference to mine and minerals. This is not a note in the registered state, uh, uh, includes the mines or minerals for the purpose of the indemnity provisions of LRA 2002, and uh, uh, which I will come back to shortly, uh, the indemnity provisions don't cover mines and minerals because they're such a nightmare for identifying titles. However, in the interest of full disclosure, turn on to page 43 in paragraph 3.37 and 3.38. This 
is under issues with the current law. Uncertainty as to who owns mines and minerals. Aha. Um, 3.37. Furthermore, in situations where title to mines and minerals is not expressly stated on the register, it's unclear whether the registration of the surface title includes the mines and minerals beneath it. Dr. Charles Harkin and Janet Bignall QC have suggested that registration of surface land includes the mines and minerals below it by virtue of the fact that under the LRA 2002 that land includes mines and minerals, whether or not held with the surface. That's section 4.9. Uh, the common law presumption elucidated in, in Bacardo, the owner of the surface land, uh, uh, owns the strata beneath it, unless it's been alienated, combined with the effect of section 58 of the LRA 2002, also suggests that mines and minerals may be included in the registration of surface title, even if the absence of an express note to that effect. Land registry practice also supports this position. As noted paragraph 3.283 above, land registry will create a separate title, where on a transfer of a surface title which did not expressly include mines and minerals, mines and minerals are reserved to the transfer order. Better the page. Here's the problem. 3.38. On the other hand, including mines and minerals with the registration of surface title could deprive the owner of an unregistered state, i.e. us, in mines and minerals of his or her title, where titles to the surface and to the mines and minerals were separate, held separately were separate before the surface title is registered. Moreover, it seems odd that a proprietor of an estate in the surface land can essentially extend his or her estate merely by virtue of registration. The answer to this may be that the mines and minerals are included, but only presumptively, in the event that the presumption can be rebutted and application may be made to alter the registrar, register under Schedule 4, Paragraph 2.1b or c. And indeed, if you turn on to tab 4, and you, this is Land Registry Practice Guide 65, Registration of Mines and Minerals, and you turn on to Paragraph 4, which is at internal page 6 of 11, Inclusion of Mines and Minerals. Indeed, the practice guide says the mines and minerals are rebuttably presumed to be included in the registered title of surface land. This reflects the common law position with regard to mines and minerals where the surface lands are unregistered. However, paragraph 2 of Schedule 8 of the Land Registration Act, which is in the authorities, provides that no indemnity is payable in respect to mines and minerals unless there's a specific note in the register that title to them is included. Now, what we say to that is, number one, it does seem extraordinary that an unregistered mineral owner can lose their title simply by registration by the service owner, without any notes being included. But the answer, if that is the case, if that is an incorrect interpretation of Section 4 of the Land Registration Act, is that you can then, as the unregistered owner, once you've identified that you have those, that you are entitled to those, and in our case that there hasn't been adverse possession of them, you can then apply for amendment of the register under Schedule 4 of the Land Registration Act. And if you turn to tab 2, yeah, paragraph 2, alteration pursuant to court order. The court may make an order for alteration of the register for the purpose of correcting the mistake, bringing the register up to date, or giving effect to any estate right or interest accepted from the effect of the registration. An order under this paragraph has effect when served on the registrar to impose a duty on him to give effect to it. Now, the answer in the skeleton of my learned friend is you can't get this because it would be what's called rectification. And rectification um, uh, is where effectively where the amendment adversely impacts somebody's rights. Uh, and if you turn over the page to paragraph 6, you can't get rectification where someone's in possession. Paragraph 6, 1, the paragraph applies to the power under paragraph 5, so as far as relating to rectification. No alteration affecting the title of the proprietor of registered state in land may be made under paragraph 5 without the proprietor's consent in relation to land in his possession. But we say, unless, number one, ignore, not fraud or lack of proper care, but number, oh, not A, but B, it would for any other reason be unjust for the alteration not to be made. So one, we could get it because it would be unjust. And two, if you turn back to tab one, paragraph, section 131 of the LRA, 2002, proprietary in possession, sub one. For the purposes of this act, land is in the possession of the proprietor of a registered estate in land if it is physically in his possession or that of a person who is entitled to be registered as a proprietor of a registered estate. So a deemed possession doesn't work. So when you are talking about mines and minerals, you're never going to have, for rectification in this situation, somebody who is physically in possession, assuming that they haven't got Particularly, particularly assuming they haven't got title by means of adverse possession. So the answer to their point about all of this is, number one, it seems an extraordinary interpretation of Section 4 of the Land Registration Act to allow this to happen. And number two, so long as we get a declaration that we were entitled to these things, we'll just go off and get the register corrected 
amended their arm. So it's not a huge problem. Very last point. Form of order, trial on liability. We, have a, we had a trial on liability of first instance where it was found that the basis of the adverse possession conclusion was that there had been extraction of reserve material. Or if, or, or rather the judge said, if I'm wrong about the nature of what the reserve materials are, then there's been extraction of reserve materials and that gives rise to adverse possession. We have a finding that there's been extraction. We've got an order to that that was a trial on liability. We've got a determination of liability for the extraction. We then go to quantum, which will determine precisely how much and what the quantum in each location is. It is absurd to suggest that there's some sort of problem with our claim. It is exactly what was provided for by means of a separation of trial on liability versus quantum. We did not need to go into the quantum of, as of the volume of stone being extracted particularly by reference to the road building, etc. That was deliberately done, and in any event, it is entirely open to this court to, to direct that there should be an inquiry and account thereafter. However, as I say, I'll deal with that mostly in reply. I apologise for having taken quite a bit longer than I'd expected. Was, well, half an hour longer than I was expected. I apologise to my own friend and your lordship. Now, before I sit down, it's been a whistle-stop tour through the case. Quite a few points. Is there anything I can further assist your lordships with? Well, I suppose I should also turn around and check that I haven't got any messages from behind. Yes. yes. Well, um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr Moran, you've had quite a lot of questioning from us, which no doubt partly explains why you over chopped your estimate a little. Um, Always fun. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. So, Mr. Wannacott. My lords, I'll start with the A type point. Um, listening to my own friend, it struck me that his argument is straight out of the paradigm example score of linguistic philosophy. He says every word has a paradigm or natural meaning. Mudstone is a paradigm example of stone. Therefore, every sentence which uses the word stone must include mudstone. That's the basis of the argument. It's a very sort of 1950s Oxford idea. In fact, it comes straight out of Herbert Hart's concept of law, where he said that the purpose of a definition of elephant is to provide a form of words into which elephant could be substituted. And he suggested, you don't need to note this, um, a quadruped distinguished from others by its possession of a thick skin, tusks, and a trunk. And he said, that's your, your paradigm elephant. Well, people have made fun of that. Brian Simpson pointed out that some elephants do not possess tusks, and some have been poached and skinned, but they're still elephants. And if I say, my daughter is an elephant, that doesn't mean she's got tusks or a trunk or indeed a thick skin. The truth is that the plain and ordinary meaning of a word varies according to, I'm going to sound pretentious now, what Wittgenstein called the language game being played at the time. And there isn't any necessarily any overlap at all. I'm going to pinch an idea from Brian Simpson again. Um, he gave an, a, a very good example. He says, you're listening to a pilot who says to air traffic control, negative, holding short, traffic short finals. Those are ordinary English words. According to the paradigm theory, you ought to be able to work out what is being communicated just from the core meaning of each of those words. But unless you're familiar with the language game played with ATC, that meaning is completely opaque to you. You've got no idea what's going on. What they in fact mean is, although you have cleared me to enter the runway, I'm not going to do so because there's an aeroplane about to land on it which you have idiotically missed. 
other words, the meaning of word always depends on its context. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same with conveyances. The question isn't, what is the ordinary meaning of the word stone for stop? That's a meaningless question. It's, what's the plain and ordinary meaning of the word stone in the context of a mineral reservation of a conveyance of land? And that's an iterative process, as we are constantly reminded. It doesn't involve trying to identify a paradigm meaning of stone and then seeing whether it fits, any more than it would for the word metal or mineral. It involves looking at the context of the sense as a whole and working out what is being communicated by the reservation. Man walks into a jeweler's in Hatton Garden and says, What stones have you got? The jeweler doesn't think, Well, mudstone is a paradigm example of the word stone, so he must be asking about mudstone. Um, my other friend also said, to illustrate his point, that you could not describe wood as a stone. He might be surprised to learn that in Marquis of Linguithgow and North British Railway Board, which is in Authority Bundle 1 um, at um, ooh, I'm sorry, I haven't got the tab. At tab 10 great people like Leonard Jr. Um, if you go to 1353, you'll see that Lord Dunedin, in the penultimate paragraph on that page, explains how the word coal can include wood. Sorry, 1353 appears Thir to be Lord Johnston. Oh, I'm sorry, it is, it is Lord Johnson rather than Lord Dunedin. Um, but if you go to the penultimate paragraph, the word coal signifies something which, when kindled or glows, it is consumed. And its root idea has something that can be used for fuel. The fire of coals on the hearth, in the authorised version, was doubtless a fire of wood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was also going to do something else, um, but my learner junior, who doesn't like me making theatrical gestures, stopped me. Um, I have, amongst my collection of interesting stones in chambers, uh, a piece of petrified wood. It's a piece of wood that would be described as a stone. I was going to bring it over. But I... I must say that thought had crossed my mind this morning too. <laughs> so what I got yeah. um, so that's the linguistic argument. Um, it's important also to appreciate that we have to understand the conveyance in a way that a conveyancer would understand it, and a conveyancer at the time. And that means bringing with him all the knowledge of the cases that have been decided where general words have been confined in mineral reservations to materials that had value. And, and to show that that is uh, orthodox law, I'm just going to go very briefly to Common Ipstock, sorry, Common and Ipstock Brick, which is volume one of the Authority Bundle, tab 16. I don't suppose this is the case I'm thinking of, but I, can, I remember Lord Simon used to quite frequently say you have to tune into the linguistic register of the. People Indeed. who are using the language that you have to construe. I, 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 as, it, as it sometimes, um, I, in fact, I'm going to take you to a passage in a moment in another case, just because it will only take two minutes and it's quite fun, which makes exactly that point. Um, but in Common and Ipstock Brick, decision of this court, uh, when the judgment was given by Lord Justice Lawrence Collin, the okay. issue was whether brick shale and fire clay were other metals or minerals in a 1921 conveyance. 
And if you could just go to the last page. I'm so sorry, which tab are we at? My fault. We're at tab 16, tab tab under 16. one. Thank you. And paragraph 71, which is the first paragraph at the top of the page. One, two, three, four, five lines down, he says, third, the then state of the law should be taken to have been known to the draftsman. Conveyances of property in the area drafting mineral reservations would have been aware that the House of Lords had decided four cases between 1888 and 1911 in which it was held that ordinary clay was not a mineral, but the clays um, were, with special properties were minerals. It's a reasonable inference that the draftsman intending to reserve common clay would have inserted an express reservation. Now the case that's quite fun, just to reinforce that point, is at tab three. And this is Thelusson and Lord Rendlesham in the House of Laws in 1859. And this was the litigation that inspired Jarndyce and Jarndyce. It was about the Thelusson will, where Peter Thelusson directed that his property should be accumulated for as long as possible. And then the jackpot would go to um, uh, his eldest male lineal descendant. And the question was, did you read those words like an ordinary person? You put all the descendants in a room, you say, right, who's the oldest here? Or did it mean the eldest male of the eldest male line, which is how a conveyancer would read it? And if in the report you could just go forward to page 180 and the judgment of Miss Justice Biles, there's a sidelined passage that perhaps you could read, um, which makes the same point as my Lord Lord Justice Hendrickson has just made to me. Where did you say 480? Uh, it's page 180. 180, I'm so yes. sorry. Um, 448 in the nominate, 180 in the English. And that's the point. A plain and ordinary man, to use the description there, your averagely intelligent Radio 4 listener, couldn't tell you what this conveyance meant. The second word in some of them is indenture. There are some lawyers who don't know what an indenture is. He could tell you it was a swizz if he thought he was buying a farm, and it turned out he was just getting the organic detritus on the top. But if you asked him to pass the conveyance and explain why he got the bedrock, he'd say, I don't know, ask my lawyer. The lawyer is his translator. And once you look at these instruments through the spectacles of a late, late 19th or early 20th century conveyancer, all doubt about the meaning of the word stone disappears. because the courts had consistently told conveyances that general words like this are harmless because they mean things that in the judge's words have value for commercialization. Why was the word stone added to the word minerals. What is it that, that prompted the draftsman to do that? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, as the cases point out, 
the etymological meaning of mineral is something dug out of a mine. But more importantly, there was a decision of Lord Eldon in the House of Lords in 1818 in a case called Mingis and the Earl of Breedlebane, which held that building stone wasn't a mineral for the purpose of a Scottish view charter reserving ale mines, minerals of whatever nature and quality. You may think, well, Scottish decision 1818, conveyances don't really notice it. But it's picked up by Lord Hornsbury in Fairy's case. And it's probably worth briefly having a look at that. Um, Fairy's case is at tab six of this bundle. And uh, at page 672, <coughs> uh, yes, it's the paragraph at the bottom of the page in his speech. Uh, he says, uh, my lords, if that were correct for you, and I find myself unable to differ from it. I think the case of Lord Breedlebane and Mingis is binding authority in this house. There the words were ale mines and minerals of whatever nature and quality were held not to include a vein of, building, of stone suitable for building. And over the page he goes on to say, well, that was right. And that's picked up again in Budhill in Lord Shaw's speech. Bud Hill is at tab 8, uh, at page 135. At the bottom of 135, he refers to Mingis and the Earl of Breedlebane. And then he discusses it through 136. He explains that it's been followed in Scotland in Duke of Hamilton and Bentley. And then he points out that when the railway acts are passed, that was settled law. And he describes it as settled law next to the reference to Duke of Hamilton's case in the middle paragraph, um, about 15 lines down. And he says, the railway acts were drafted with that in mind. I'm sorry, where, where, where do we find that bit? Um, it's the sentence beginning, it is not without significance. In which on which on, page? Which is on page 136, oh. middle paragraph, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13 lines down. It is not without significance that the Duke of Hamilton's case, accepting the settled law as above, as described, occurred in the year 1841. The Railway Clauses Act was passed within four years. Now, for myself, the greatest difficulty in understanding how you suggested that Parliament then, and thus using the language mines, minerals, etc., did so in a different sense from that authoritatively accepted as the common law of the land. Yeah. And so that's the point. Conveyances in the Victorian period know that if they want to reserve building stone, the word minerals is not good enough. And then two short points before I finish on category A. I think I can do them in a minute. Um, my other friend's skeleton makes reference to Midland Railway and Checkley. Um, Midland Railway and Checkley is disapproved by the House of Lords in Budhill. Uh, Lord Lauriburn says at page 125, no decision has gone that far. And Lord Gorrell at 130 
There's, that's not the normal mean. To be fair to Lord Romilly, that case involved an early Canal Act, and there was a view at the time that Canal Act simply gave a statutory easement for the passage of water and the passage of horses along the towpath and nothing else. And in that context, perhaps Checkley made sense. The second point is that my other friend made some, made some point, I'm afraid I wasn't entirely clear what it was, about the significance of the fact that the compensation clause dealt with surface damage. They always do. Because the surface is what contains the things that are valuable that are going to be damaged by, by mine. The mudstone itself is, is, is valueless. You can damage it as much as you like underneath. It's when the surface collapses on top, taking down your buildings, that you suffer loss. And that, as, that, as I say, is perfectly standard for any mineral reservation, even if it's just coal or something that's been reserved. And the other thing we have to bear in mind is in the real world, conveyances in the mid 19th century, just as today, will probably begin by turning to a precedent. And they yes. will follow a time honored form of words, probably with a sigh of relief that they don't have to think about matters too much, except for new points, which have to be fitted into the standard language or which the is, standard we, template. We, we, which is why words accrete to the precedents like barnacles. It's because whenever a new point comes along, like building stone isn't a mineral, someone adds an extra word to the precedent. Yes, right. Well, I think that's all I've got to say on the A cases, and that might be an appropriate. Well, I think that's rather good timing, uh, Mr. Wonnecott. Thank you very much. Um, are you happy you'll have enough time to deal with the rest of the case tomorrow? Oh, I, going? I, I tend to be fairly quick. Oh, um, my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold asked about this book. I don't know whether you, you want to see it or... No, only to be informed what nature of the book <laughs> it is. It, 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 it's, it's a book by um, some very distinguished Cambridge academics who analyse the surveying aspects of enclosure, and indeed who say that... But am I right that what was being referred to was an introductory essay by them? Well, no, I mean, the, well, it, it's a rather long, long essay. I mean, it, it goes the, the first 200 pages of the book. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Doesn't sound like bedside reading, at any rate. <laughs> it takes several evenings. Um, but thank you very much. We'll continue then at uh, 10.30 tomorrow. Uh -huh.